and gentlemen, welcome to the last day of the Martin Roth Symposium 2020 here in wonderful Berlin, beautiful Berlin, here in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Presented by IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, in cooperation with Republika, this second Martin Roth Symposium 2020 takes place as a digital theme week from 7th to 11th September 2020, here in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, funded also by the German Federal Foreign Office. So thanks for the organizing partners. The symposium, as you all know, aims to bring together thought leaders from the political, the artistic, the academic, and of course, the economic and the cultural sectors to share ideas and their scenarios and their visions for the future forward about museums and future. And today, this is beautiful to see, we meet in person for a hybrid analog event with you in the live stream, but of course, with the participants here in the audience. Thank you very much for being here. Give ourselves a big round of applause for starting into our live stream of today. And welcome also for tuning in today here in the live stream. We're going to dive into our topic of today. We had lots of topics in the past week. Today, we discuss about museums and failure. But we're going to discuss this not as an oxymoron, but rather as a necessity. So. Failure, as we know, has, um, yeah, has a value for self-reflection, also gives this push and this energy for innovation. But we ask ourselves today, what does failure mean in the world of museums and, of course, for the museum sector? Where is the space, actually, where we can talk about our mistakes, our pitfalls, and where can we reflect upon wrong decisions in a culture that so often emphasizes just the impact stories, the good news, and, of course, the success stories? How and where can we learn from negative experiences and from disappointments we all made on the, on the way forward, right? So, how do we take responsibility for our mistakes? How can we share our experience of knowledge about the lessons learned? And the question is also, do we need a new spirit? Do we need a new spirit, maybe a more entrepreneurial culture that exactly embraces this failure? what conditions and values are needed in museums for a productive learning processes, for an open exchange, and of course, for a dynamic, self-reflective cultures. Speakers today will present their thoughts on the topic and the questions, of course, in sprint sessions, which are 10-minute inputs. And following the sprints, we are going to have deep dives. I know you already know and you're familiar with that format. Deep dive is a deep exchange between you the audience and you, the participants in the live stream. So please share your questions, raise a hand here in the venue hall if you have a question, and share your questions in the live stream. Just tap the button, dabei sein, taking part on campus.republica.com to get it right with the website. So this was a little outline for today. I'm very excited to see so many beautiful smiles without a mask. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining in and dialing in today. Please welcome now for the welcoming words on stage with a big round of applause again, Ulrich Rauf, the president of the Institute für Auslandsbeziehungen. Welcome. And also with us, Dr. Sarah Darwin from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Welcome. Ms. Koch from Republika cannot be with us tonight, unfortunately, just to mention that, but we're going to start with the welcoming words. Mr. Rolf, the world is yours. Thank you, Katie. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth day of the Martin Roth Symposium. Unlike the four previous sessions, this one, this last one, will allow us at least a bit of old-fashioned real presence. But Martin, Martin wrote, I'm sure, would have enjoyed the way we discussed these days across continents, oceans, and time zones. Our topics were mainly still identical with his agenda. He considered the museum as a public space, an agora an open space that he defined in a radically democratic way. As a group of friends, or a band of friends, of Martin, the IFA, that is the Institute for Foreign Relations, we feel 
deeply committed to Martin's ideas and ideals. That is why we created the Martin Roth Symposium as an open forum for the discussion of themes and topics at the intersection of culture and politics. As a general subject for this year's Martin Roth Symposium too, we have chosen one of the most intriguing questions in this field, the future of museums. In the three years since Martin passed away, new political and social challenges have arisen. I mention only the most visible ones, the pandemic crisis we are going through and the fights for political freedom and social justice we are witnessing from Portland to Hong Kong. Only 400 meters from here, Alexei Navalny is fighting the effects of a poison attack on his life undertaken in his country, his home country, Russia. And only 500 meters from here, you have the German government still struggling for a political answer to this political crime. Whatever the outcome of this crisis will be, it might deeply affect our cultural relations with Russia too. These challenges and the answers given repeatedly during this conference, I call them the big three Ds for digitizing, digitizing, decolonization, sorry, <laughs> and diversity do in fact concern the body and soul of the museum as well as its practical operations. In their consequence, they may give the long history of the museum a new and unexpected twist. They will confront us and the old, if not ancient, institution we're talking about with new chances to do things right and new chances of making mistakes and finally of failure. One of the greatest and some may say craziest artists, European artists of my generation, or the generation before, the Belgian concept artist and situationist Marcel Brothaas has foreseen this situation when he posted the following offer. I have a postcard of his offer, which says, Musée à vendre pour cause de faillite. Museum to sell for cause of failure. I'm sorry to say I missed the opportunity to buy me a, a personal museum. Before I lay down the microphone, let me conclude with some sentences that all begin with the words, thank you. The Martin Road Symposium would not have been possible without you. First, thank you to Harriet Road and to the advisory board for your ideas and your commitment. Thank you to the Foreign Office, to Republica, and to the National Museum. And thank you, last not least, to my colleagues and to the entire IFA team. And thank you, the audience, for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Raul. Dr. Sarah Darwin. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome uh, everybody, the live stream and everybody here, a live audience. This is something I haven't experienced for uh, several months. So a very, very big warm welcome to the Museum of Naturkunde Berlin. I'm gonna talk very, very briefly about Charles Darwin in relation 
to failure. Charles Darwin, of course, is most famous for his success in his theory of evolution by natural selection. This theory involves both success and failure. And as Darwin wrote, extinction and natural selection go hand in hand. Extinction is the ultimate failure and, of course, is irreversible. But as one of Charles Darwin's great-great-grandchildren, I'm interested in his emotional journey as well as his intellectual journey. And here I would argue that failure played a massive role in his development as a person. The young Charles Darwin was regarded by his father as a failure. Charles Darwin didn't reach his potential at school, and he was taken out and sent to medical school at 16. He dropped out of medicine. After two years, he couldn't cope with the blood and gore, and he then was sent to Cambridge to study to be a clergyman. He completed the course, but not wanting to become a vicar. His father complained in a letter, you care for nothing but dogs, shooting, rat catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and to your whole family. Darwin was then given an opportunity to join a voyage that would travel around the world, and this would allow him to be the naturalist and pursue his love and passion for nature. I would suggest it was his fear of failure that encouraged him to work hard observing and collecting specimens for that five years. He found fossil remains of a giant extinct sloth in Argentina, and he found birds in the Galapagos Islands and observed how the shapes of the birds and the beaks were adapted to their environment. But he spent 20 years after he returned to the UK writing his theory up. And I would say that it was his fear of failure that actually made this theory a success. He spent 20 long years thinking about all of the arguments that people might have against his theory. He wrote to people around the world, I gather around four letters a day. He contacted naturalists. He wanted answers to all of the questions that he could think of. And that was a fear of failure, I would argue. And his success was, in fact, that he waited all this time, collected the evidence, and then finally published his book, which, of course, was a massive success. It sold out on the day of publication. Later in life, Darwin lamented that he had failed by not doing more for his fellow creatures, the plants and animals that inhabit our planet. This is a legacy that's very close to my heart. And failure of our generation to prevent mass extinction of species and habitat destruction would be absolutely unacceptable. Today, we must protect nature and democracy. And with that, I would like to welcome you all, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Darwin and Ulrich Rauf. Thank you.